questions, comments, concerns? <laughs> and, uh, and your name. Uh, my name is Harry. I missed your introduction, but... Uh, oh, he should give it again. It was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you were... Your family emigrated from Ghana to, to the UK, and then you came here with your family? And um, then, yeah. how has your uh, relationship been with Ghana, direct and indirect, since then? And I was curious if there were any novelists that you feel uh, influenced your writing style. Okay, so that's like seven questions. <laughs> but I'll answer them all. It's like an hour answer. <laughs> I was, um, my father's from Ghana. He is of the Ewe people from the Volta region of Ghana, hence my name, Selassie, which is not Ethiopian, but Ewe, Selassie. My mother is mostly Nigerian, but a little bit Scottish too. Um, he was born in Ghana, she was born in London. They met in Lusaka, in Zambia, where he was her medical school instructor. Um, shady, really. <laughs> um, they then moved to London, well, first to Ireland, then to London for work. Both of them are doctors. And um, then I was born, and they split up. My father, who's from Ghana, went to Saudi Arabia, where he lives to this day. And my mother, who's Nigerian, raised my twin and me in Massachusetts. And then when we had finished um, college, she moved to Ghana. So, even yeah. though she was Nigerian. Even though she still is Nigerian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So my relationship to Ghana is pretty straightforward. At, um, 15, I started going there every year for Christmas, and then um, 15 years ago my mother moved there, so now my sister and I are there at least once a year to see her. I've never lived there in the sense that the maximum time I've spent there is about three months, three summer months, but um, it's absolutely a one of three homes and a huge part of our family's lives. Did I get them all? In the second part? <laughs> novelists, novelists, yes, I remember that one. Um, <laughs> Do you, novelists specifically from Ghana, or, or like, do I just any, like in general, novels? like with their Chinua, Chinua Achebe or somebody, United States or Britain or wherever? Novelists that I like from wherever? Would you feel like I've influenced your writing style? Oh, okay. Oh, so many. Um, but I gave this list the other day, and though it's necessarily incomplete, I thought that it was at the very least representative. And they were Scott Fitzgerald, Arundhati Roy, an Italian author named Alessandro Barrico, um, Penelope Lively, a British author, and Toni Morrison. I think in, in, when I read them for the first time, all of them, I was smitten. I mean, beyond help, <laughs> beyond salvation. And I see, at least I hope I see, I dream that I see traces of their influence in my writing. going from the process of writing to reading your writing aloud and how you figure out breathing and pacing because your writing is so there's long sentences so how do you pace how do you got how has it been hard on the book tour to go from being in the writing as a writer to really being a reader well it's funny that you say that Jessica Lee of Sudbury, Massachusetts yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my best friend from seventh grade <laughs> um, I, there is no transition because when I'm when I'm writing the work, I hear it out loud. I, I genuinely it's it's more like hearing it than writing it, and it always goes really really fast if it happens at all, and I just sort of type as quickly as I can, trying to catch this tide as it's as it's loosed. Then after I've done that, I'll have to print out what I've written front and back, <laughs> and, um, and then I read it out loud to myself to see, to make sure, it's not even really to, um, to observe anything in my own writing, but just to, to see if, I, if what I've heard I've managed to type. And so um, reading out loud now doesn't feel, in, in fact it's funny, it feels more intimately related to my original writing process than reading the work um, in silence, in, in book form. Mm -hmm. But I struggle a little bit with not reading too fast because in my in my head um, in my head it goes really really fast and I can read I can read large portions of this novel um, from memory strangely 
And um, I think that's because of the way that I received it. It's like something that had already been, a story that had already been told. Please. Uh, you're living in Rome now, is that what you said? Uh, how long have you been there and how did you decide to go there? Um, I didn't. I decided to go to Paris because I thought after I had signed my book deal and was suffering from writer's block and needed to leave New York, I thought that would be the perfect place to go to finish a novel. I sort of imagined myself, I'd said, like a cross between James Baldwin and Josephine Baker. <laughs> you know, like sitting in a cafe, smoking though I don't, in a banana skirt and beret. <laughs> was my, um, my earnest intention and my deepest desire, and I could not for the life of me find an apartment in Paris. I mean, I could not. And it turns out that it is a bit difficult these days to find a, a flat in France, but um, I was dismayed, I was beside myself, when completely by chance, a friend of a friend of a friend asked if I um, would be interested in renting for a short time a flat that he has in Piazza de España, in, by the Spanish Steps. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Spanish, I mean, is that Spain? Like, what? Like, no. <laughs> I, no, I, I go looking for an apartment in Paris, remember? He was like, no, I think you'd like it. And so I packed a tiny little carry-on bag, and I went there intending to stay for four weeks, and I fell head over heels in love with the city. And then over the course of the ensuing two years, I, I moved there for good, aided by the fact that I was born in London, and I hold an easy passport, I should say. So you've been there two years? I've only really lived there for one year. Oh. I first went two years ago, but I left you know, an entire life and apartment in New York behind. And then at a certain point I was like, oh wait, I should go back and shut that down. <laughs> so you said there were three homes, I assume Ghana, uh, Rome, and Massachusetts, or New York? New York. Okay. Yeah, New York City, Not Ghana. to be so nosy. <laughs> no, please, don't visit me in any one of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is the, I feel like so much of this and what I've heard you write is autobiographical and like what role does that play in your writing and then also the, I feel like you, there's a pressure that has been kind of put on you to speak for an experience that is largely untold in this part of the world mm. and how much does that pressure impact you just personally? Okay, so to the first question about um, the writing being autobiographical, I should say it's true that my father is a surgeon from Ghana, and the father in this novel is a surgeon from Ghana, and my mother is Nigerian and Scottish, and the mother in this novel is Nigerian and Scottish. Two of the children in the Psy family go to Yale, one of them to Harvard Med School and to Hopkins, and my twin sister and I went to Yale, she went to Harvard Med School, and then on. To Hopkins, but other than that, there are really no similarities between the novel and my family. Really, it's surprising for so many other questions. Um, but I, but I, 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 I can explain that. I can explain that. It's, it makes perfect sense that you that you would ask that. But this is what happened. I found very quickly when I started telling the story that the more that the that the least attention and effort and and even energy that I gave to what I call superficial details like the names of streets, the names of buildings, the, the, the type of tree that grows on the side of the road. The least energy I gave to those kind of details, the more I could give to the ones that really interested me. So the interior lives of these people, their motivations, their hurts, their hopes, their, is there a way that I can alliterate that? Their homes, you know what I mean? Like I found that, that just by, it's like I, I feel like I just took the paint off the surface of my life. And I should say, in fairness to them, off of the lives of my family members too. And I just applied it to this family. But it, it was a huge um, vindication for me when my mother finished the novel. She was the first family member who read it. And this was <clears throat> two months ago. They were like terrified of this novel. They were just like, look at it and be like, oh my God. <laughs> it's like the beginning of the end for our family. I was like, no, if you read it, you'll see that it's not about our family. And my mom said, when she finished it, that she felt as if opening it, she thought she would find my opinion of her. And I teased her, I was like, Mom, 
I'm pretty outspoken. If I wanted to tell you what I thought about you, I would have taken 336 pages of two years to do it. An email would have sufficed a text. But she read it, and it was just beautiful. She said, from, from the first page, I saw that these characters are completely their own. And even she, my mother, Nigerian and Scottish though she is, was able to engage with these characters as separate people and almost as real people. And that, that sort of, um, that was calming for me. Because I knew why, I knew whence the similarities arose. I, I, I know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that they're only superficial. But I feared that my family might not, might not see that. But they did, and they do. And um, I have my own story, I've said. I, it's, very, um, it's very complicated. Better suited to soap opera than literary fiction. <laughs> but this isn't it. This is the story of the size. And it was my honor and pleasure to write it. Pressure, pressure to talk about or represent the um, contemporary, clean and articulate African person. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'm not that clean. No, 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 I, I, know, I, know, I know that pressure. I, it sort of, I can, I can see it, I can hear it lurking behind the least thought out questions that I receive about this book, but I don't, I don't engage with it. I, I don't, I just, it's not because I don't love the two countries on the African continent that my family comes from, I do, with all of my heart. But um, I don't believe in continental literature. I don't think that there is such thing as African literature. I wouldn't be able to walk through this bookstore and put together a pile of books that could fall under that category. I, um, I've said that for me as a reader, and equally so as a writer, the identity of consequence is the writings and not the writers. And so when I think about my work, I spend so much time and I pay so much attention to every syllable. I'm just sort of sitting there in an apartment in Rome, reading out loud to myself, like a kindergarten teacher who lost her class, <laughs> that the last thing I'm thinking of, literally, I, don't, I simply don't have excess surplus energy to give to a sociopolitical conversation. Um, and that's okay. I, I participate in that conversation with other forms of, um, of work, including um, essay writing, documentary filmmaking, and photography. So I leave the, the, the prose alone, and I, you know, I carry out my diabolical agenda mm -hmm. in other ways. Can, can you talk about one of those projects, the, about 21-year-olds? I sure can, Alan Shevet of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> um, a plant. A plant. A groupie. This past <laughs> summer, I started a documentary, which I did conceive of in the face of that pressure. I was actually Googling images. I was trying to find, literally, I was just trying to find an image of an African young man. So, you know, I went, I went into Google image search, and I put in African young man, nothing. So then I tried African boy. And I noticed that the related searches that were listed across the top of the page included sad African boy, African boy flies, African boy soldier. And I was like, hmm, <laughs> that's no bueno. So I started Googling more and more, and I was just struck by the absence of imagery in this part of the world of African 20-somethings. So my peers, a few years ago. <laughs> the people that, I, that I've seen today in, in San Francisco, in the Mission, and here in The Hague, just young people who are neither destitute nor disproportionately wealthy, so not the children of like people who are living off of national oil revenues, not them, but neither people who are living in, in um, hopeless grinding poverty, and not because those people don't exist, but because I think we've seen enough of them. I decided that I wanted to photograph, originally I said a 21-year-old in all 54 African countries. I chose 21 because I think of it as an age emblematic of the beginning of adulthood and the dawn of maturity for the lucky, certainly not for me. But um, when I got to West Africa this summer, I started with six countries. I, I, who go to Ghana every year, was amazed by what I found, just blown away. So <laughs> I went to the um, proposal and I just deleted 21 and now it's 20 something, 54. <laughs> and um, uh, the friend that I brought along with me to document my photography project found 
herself with a full length documentary on her hands. So now we're finishing the fundraising so that she can create the documentary, which just details the everyday lives of 20 somethings in African countries. And, you know, I joke, our last stop was Benin, which is um, a, a small French speaking country right next to Nigeria, where they have the best. Afro Bavarian beer called Eku. I mean, crazy stuff. But this guy saw me with my um, 5D Mark III, which is not conspicuous to say the least. And he walked over and he was a little indignant. He was like, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Oh, we're um, we're on a project. We're photo we're um, taking photographs of African young people all around the continent." And he was like, "Oh." Like, not more images of skinny, starving people. And I was like, no, you're thinking of New York Fashion Week. These people are really well fed and awesome. <laughs> and then he started laughing, and he ended up being one of my subjects. So we had a great time, lots of laughs. And um, I can't wait to finish the project. Please. I have a question. How did you uh, come up with the concept of the uh, camera man? I think that's so wonderful. I know. So. Afi Jamila, you've heard me quote Leonard Cohen before when asked where do his songs come from. He said, if I knew where they came from, I'd go there more often. <laughs> that is exactly how I feel about this, um, this entire novel. And, but, but two characters in particular. The one is that cameraman, and that cameraman appears on the second page of text, which was the first Microsoft Word page when I was writing it. Um, when I had escaped from the yoga retreat that I was in in Sweden, <laughs> which was meant to be relaxing, but wasn't, because it was run by these Germans. I <laughs> and it was October, and I thought Sweden was going to be like autumnal and beautiful, and it was freezing cold. This, interestingly enough, is where these people came to me, as in a dream, except for it was as in a shower. And um, the yoga retreat forbade the use of electronics, so I had no iPhone, no laptop, barely a stub of a pencil, no eyeliner, nothing with which I could write the, the words that were bursting within me down. So my friend and I, we escaped, we always joke, to Copenhagen, where I typed out the first 10 pages of Ghana Musco, which are printed here almost exactly as I wrote them. And the cameraman is there on the first page. I love that cameraman. And you know who else I loved? Mr. Lanty, the carpenter, with his, like, swami I, you know, I don't know where that dude came from. <laughs> I really don't. He is no composite of anyone I know. Um, but, you know, I, I hope that many more like him await me. Please. So what was the editorial Please? process for, for you like? Because you, your stories and your characters are so fully realized. So like, you know, working with your editor, what was that like in kind of like, you know, collaborating with somebody else on it? Paul. Oh, Paul. Paul. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, and I have to admit, a bookstore that I, I've been to once before and I've been waiting to go back to, that City Lights. It's just amazing. Anyway, um, my editor, Anne, got off. When I first met my agent, he said to me, do you know who you would like to edit your book? And I was just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Anybody, anyone who will pay more than $5.55 for it can edit my book. He was like, no, Ty, I'd like you to do a bit of research, blah, blah, blah. So I found out that Anne had been involved in two novels that I adore. One of them is The God of Small Things, one of my favorite novels, and the other is White Tea. And I thought, oh my gosh, like one editor, two amazing debuts, I kind of want her to be my editor. And as luck would have it, um, she, she was, she is. Anne is incredibly hands-off in her approach. She doesn't work with terribly many fiction writers. Most of her um, charges write nonfiction. And I think that she, she chooses authors based on voice, a, a quality to the writing that she is concerned not to interrupt and not to compromise in any way. So I met Anne when she bought two books and I had yet to finish one. <laughs> um, and I didn't see her again for two years. And she didn't write to me, she didn't call me, she didn't ask, when are you going to submit your manuscript even though I missed two deadlines? Um, and when I finally sat down with her, when I did get the thing done, she just said, I knew, I knew you would do it. I knew, I knew you could and I knew you would. And her, her notes for me were entirely to do with places where I had been perhaps a bit too gestural in my approach. I have a very condensed writing style. Um, 
I joke, I have a very condensed gestural writing style and I have a very condensed gestural-like style. <laughs> but in some places it can be hard, I'm learning for the reader to follow. So in some places, in some places I say in 78,000 words what, can be, what could be said in seven. In some places I say in seven words what should be said in 70,000. It's just that way. So she helped me see where I needed to open the text up a bit and let in a bit more um, exposition, this thing that you're forbidden to use in screenwriting. And that was really helpful. Um, you've read the book, Paul. Yes. So particularly Sadie, Anne really helped me. Mm. Anne read, when I, when, I, when I sold the book to Anne, 100 pages were written and I gave her an outline of the rest of the novel. And when she got the completed manuscript, I'd left out a bit about Sadie, which had been in the original outline. And she said, I strongly suggest that you put it back in. And she only ever speaks like that. She's like, I strongly suggest. But of course, the choice is yours. <laughs> She's like a zen editor. I called her one time from Roman to Panic. I was like, Anne, what if nobody likes my book? What am I going to do? I don't know. And she was like, this is exactly what she said. She was like, Ty, your book won't be perfect. I was like, Anne, what are you talking about? That's what, she was like, tell you, perfection is the Lord's. I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> perfection is the Lord's. I have to go. <laughs> Not even like, perfection is the Lord's. Do you have anything else? I have to go. <laughs> so that, that's Anne Goddard. I love her. She's like my very good friend. And um, I really look forward to working with her on the second round.